Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to call a finance committee meeting of November 3, 2023 to order at 1 p.m. And welcome everybody. Uh, remind you that uh, this meeting is being held uh, virtually by Zoom. Um, it is uh, now permitted by the um, current open meeting law requirements. Members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom, um, but everybody who's in attendance in the, um, in the audience should be aware that uh, this meeting is being recorded and um, it's being recorded for both audio and video uh, so that um, notice has been given of that. And uh, with that, I'm gonna just go through the members of the committee, make sure that uh, members can um, hear and be heard and that we can uh, know who's present. Um, Anna, Devin Lukas here. Present, and I apologize, my internet has been uh, acting up all day, so I'm gonna keep my camera off so that I don't lose you. Okay, Lynn Grisha. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. I don't think Matt Holloway is here. Um, it, I'm trying her, to find out if he's coming. He doubts he can come. I'm trying to find out if he is oh, coming. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for your clarifying. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. I'm present. Kathy Shane. Here. And I am present. And um, Lucia Walker is not yet present. So we have um, a quorum that is here. And uh, so the first uh, thing of note uh, is uh, review agenda as the completion of this process and then go to um, public comment. Um, I believe that um, their free cash has not been certified. Um, is anybody, uh, Holly? Uh, can, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, you can hear me now. Yes, actually, free cash was certified on Wednesday. We finally got the approval from the DOR. Um, I have some sort of rough estimates, um, and I can, I can, I was trying to put them together in a quick little spreadsheet for you to give you a better understanding. Um, and I can run through those numbers with you in just a couple minutes if you like. We'll do that after public comment because it's in the order of the agenda. Great. And uh, then uh, um, I think that the other things um, are listed in order. Um, as far as the uh, draft surplus real property disposition policy, uh, we had decided that uh, there was uh, no urgency that required us to uh, make a, a recommendation to the council in this term and that it could be listed as a carryover item. I put it on the agenda just so that if there are questions about it, and I actually thought of a few that uh, would require uh we could talk about it but it's uh not for um, actual action at this meeting or and we're recommending it for carryover um so and then of course we need to um, look at the work plan and the schedule uh, so that is the agenda if uh if anyone has any comments or from the committee has comments or questions about the agenda uh, please let me know. Seeing none, we'll go to public comment. So um, I am going Andy, to... Andy, uh, please ask if Alicia can hear you. Oh, thank you for pointing out. Uh, Alicia, hi. Can you confirm that uh, you can hear? Yes, thank you, Lynn and Andy. Okay, thank you. And we can hear you. So... Um, Please note uh, for the minutes that Alicia um, joined the meeting at about 10 minutes after one. And just as we're beginning the uh, public comment session and public comment, uh, we allow public comment on any issue that 
uh, is relevant to the Finance Committee. It does not have to be an item that is on the agenda today's meeting, just has to be relevant to the committee. And uh, I uh, ask you to try and confine your comments two or three minutes and begin by identifying yourself. And uh, this will start with Tony Cunningham. Uh, Tony, hi. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I heard you say there, Andy, that you're not going to take action on the surplus um, property policy today. So, so my comments can be just chalked up for future review when it comes up for a vote. But that is the item that I'm talk calling in about today. Um, so I took a quick look at the revised policy in the packet. And my primary concern to be um, clear is the Wildwood School property, which won't be coming up for disposal until at least 2027. So it's not urgent. But uh, so as I read through this policy, it's Wildwood that I have in mind. And when I see, for example, the revised point four estimated cost of restoring the property to a usable condition, I wonder if that point could be fleshed out a bit more to ensure that uh, similar wording to what's used in point seven, uh, which says two independently prepared appraisals of the property's worth and a good faith estimate of the property's value to a prospective buyer to apply some sort of similar thing to point five. Because I think if there is a desire to do one thing with the property, for example, to sell it to a developer, there could be a um, pressure to overestimate the cost of restoring the property to a usable condition. So just to ensure that that's beyond reproach, to make sure that that's done in a way that that the public can trust and that it's a genuine effort to show what it would cost to reuse it. Um, as far as things that are tang tangential to this, I think the town uh, would be, it would be great if the town did a space needs analysis of all the town services that need space. Um, we often say that there's real a real crunch on space in, in our public buildings and things like the youth community center, the empowerment center, a senior center, an early childhood center, and many other things that we have said we need space for. Having that done ahead of time before a building comes up for disposal would be a good reference document so we can see, okay, well, what are our needs? And then what is this building that we're thinking of disposing of? What could it be used for? Um, and then as far as the timing that's proposed in this policy, it says the town manager um, puts the request into the town council and the council shall hold a public hearing within 90 days. If this could be fleshed out a bit more to ensure more outreach to the public so the public know when this is coming up and have ample time to understand the pros and cons and, and the potential alternative uses. And, and to weigh in in a way that's, that's um, you know, substantive, that would be really helpful so that the public can have trust that something's not going to get sold quickly without fully, like, getting involved and understanding that. Um, uh, yeah, so more ways and time for the public to get involved. Um, thank you for the time to speak. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Tony. Appreciate the comment. It was very helpful. Uh, do we bring Renata Shepard in? Renata, you want to identify yourself and then um, have your comments. Hi, uh, Renata Shepard from Justice Drive in Amherst. Um, I'm calling about the rental registration that you're going to be discussing today, and I'm calling to re reiterate the need to make the rental registration fees fair according to my previous proposals, which I hope to hear about today. Also, um, would request that a fee, you know, maybe you consider a fee discount for low income landlords with households earning less than 100 or 150,000 a year in case the uh, non owner occupied fees turn out to be higher than $100 a year under the new or the old regulations. Um, I based that on the fact that the current $250 fee increase created a surplus. Um, which seems unreasonable if not used to maybe help us out. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Appreciate the comment. And uh, that is a topic we will come back to. 
So seeing no further requests for public comment, um, Andy, before you before you move on, Matt just joined. Can we confirm that he can hear and hear us, please? Matt, hi. Hey, Andy. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Duly noted, and please let them uh, let us, uh, reflect that Matt is here in the time of his arrival. And uh, so we'll go on to uh, getting back to uh, Holly and the free cash uh, certification report. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, hopefully I can share my screen here. And I just made uh, that possible. Thank you. Um, so I just want to point out that right now these numbers are sort of in draft format. Um, can everybody see that? Actually, yeah. got, you just it be made, because, yeah. uh yeah, we yeah, just good. see that portion. Okay, thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So free cash was certified on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday by the Department of Revenue. The free cash for the general fund was certified at 9.19 million. So, and, and these are draft numbers. They will be very close, but I'm not going to guarantee to the exact dollar until a, a few more things are worked out. But what we're looking at right now is um, three things that we have um, committed to in the past is number one, the cannabis impact fees need to be set aside. So they fall to free cash each year, and then we appropriate them into a special revenue fund so that we keep track of them because they can only be spent on specific purposes. Um, the same thing is now the first year happening with the opioid set fees, they fall to free cash, but they can only be spent on certain purposes. So we will, um, we will, we will hope to do an appropriation to move them into a special revenue fund to keep track of them separately, same as uh, we're doing with the cannabis impact fees right now. And then the third one is the cannabis tax, which we have previously committed to moving to the reparations um, fund. So with those three things that we um, have committed to in the past and assuming we're going to continue to commit to them, that's 318,000 of the 9.1 million that is automatically going to be reduced and set aside. That leaves us with about 8.8 .8 million. Um, there is likely going to come um, an appropriate an ask for additional monies to be put into roads and sidewalks of a million dollars. If that goes and if that um, comes to fruition, that will leave us with about 7.8 million of the original 9.1 free cash. So our financial policies state that um, we should keep 5% of our operating budget at, in free cash sort of at the beginning. And then um, the goal was 10% to general stabilization. So that would be 15% um, of the operating of the previous year's operating budget. And anything above and beyond that would be moved to the capital stabilization fund. So again, these are drabbers. This is just a quick, um, things may change slightly, but if we follow the um, procedures that we have in the past and all of these other things get approved, we would have approximately $2.4 million to move into the capital stabilization fund. I hope that makes sense. I put this together very quickly. <laughs> No, that's very helpful. I uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, I see Lynn's hands is up, so uh, go to questions and start with Lynn. Yeah. Uh, first of all, reminding people this is a combination of what was left from last year plus sure. this year. Okay. Uh, I think we successfully clarified that at the last meeting. Can you tell me the definition of what capital st stabilization fund covers? Do we have a definition? It would be for anything that qualifies as a capital um, expenditure. And I I don't know it right off the top of my head, but I believe it has to have um, 
a useful life of a minimum of five years and a minimum um, cost of, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it would be anything that would normally fall into our capital um, capital plan, which I believe is a five-year useful life and a minimum of a $10,000 um, cost. So and the reason I'm asking that is, would we see roads and sidewalks in that category? Um, yes, we absolutely could. So again, that's why I'm saying this is a draft. This depends on what appropriations get moved forward to the town council and to finance committee. Um, so not all of these decisions have been or have been made yet. That million dollars may or may not come into play. It could be taken out of capital. It could be taken off before. It could be taken off after. This is just a draft at this point. Um, and I appreciate that. And just one more request. And that is, could you, in an, an adjoining column, maybe before the end of the meeting, provide us with the present balance in each of these special funds, and then the another enterprise. column that would show what the new balance would be? Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to so for, questions. Uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify, Lynn. Um, for the enterprise funds you're speaking of. Yes. For example, what is okay. the present balance for reparations and what would the 105 bring it to? And the same thing would be true for the capital stabilization fund, et cetera. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Yep. I just think it helps us to know what's already there and what the new amount would be. Right. Well, when the transfers um, come to the town council in an actual uh, financial order, all that information will definitely be in there as well. Right. But Thank I'll try to quickly throw that together. And again, draft. <laughs> I We totally accept that and appreciate okay. your willingness to bring it forward this fast. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify for everybody, the uh, process is, is that uh, the town manager will make a recommendation to us, which is essentially a supplemental budget transfers and uh, under the charter. And that will go, um, then gets automatically referred to the finance committee and will be reported at a council meeting that that happened. And uh, then it comes to the committee again for actually a formal agenda discussion of the proposed transfers, whatever the town manager does, and the town manager will, at that point, make a decision as to whether to make a direct appropriation to additional appropriation to roads and sidewalks or include it in the capital stabilization fund to be done later. But uh, we don't have to discuss that today because of the discussion will happen when that occurs. And, um, with that, Bob? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I, I had the same uh, uh, request that, that Lynn did to see what the balances were, but I would make an additional uh, request versus the capital stabilization fund. And how I wouldn't expect it to be able, you'd be able to do that today. But um, as we explore this further, I'd be happy to know what we need in the capital stabilization fund to pay for the DPW and the um, fire station, the DPW facility and the fire station, just so we have some, you know, some, some, you know, guidelines as to what we might be able to use for other capital purposes. Okay, I have to do a little bit of research on that. My understanding, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. I, I wouldn't expect it at this meeting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Kathy? Lynn asked the first part of my question. It's a request, Holly. Last time you gave us what is currently in reparations fund. So for each of these, I'd like to know it for the general stabilization fund, the current capital stabilization fund. So as we're looking at what what we've already put aside. So that's just a not necessarily in conjunction with where we're going to spend it, but just 
uh, frame of reference. Could you also quickly tell us, you said cannabis impact fee has to go to a specific use and opioid settlement fees has to go to a specific use. Um, I don't need to get a detail right now, but it would be useful even if I just got a, a, a link to a place that tells me what it can be used for. And to the extent we are, are we building up funds in those accounts or are we, they're dedicated for certain things and we've been using them. So just since it doesn't go into the general fund, they're a stream of um, money. Actually, it's over $200,000 on these two lines that's been flowing into us. And I know cannabis is on it. Uh, the opioid is on its way to decline. So just that sense. Um, and then Lynn, Lynn also referred to the road and sidewalk million is a question mark. And that to me is a decision. Do we do that now? Do we reserve 2.4 million into capital? If we think any of that is supposed to be, could be used for roads, would we want to use it for roads now? And I think, Paul, we would just need a little bit more information. Not as, um, it's clear what those choices are. At one point, you said we can only go out for so much at a time um, or for roads. Or you said if we go out for a bigger amount of money, we're more likely to get the attention of the folks we're competing with for money. So that would help me think through, um, given what we've already allocated. I'm not even sure whether we've spent all of allocated because we, we did a big allocation last year. We talked about doing some out of ARPA and we've done some out of JCPC. So just kind of a sense, if we build it up to a, be a bigger amount, would we get more roads done because we would get the attention of one of the contractors that we're vying for with states and other towns? It helps me think through what makes sense to do. <laughs> doesn't necessarily tell me what to do. It just helps me think it through. Okay, thank you. Um, just Holly or Paul, if you have questions about that um, request, and you can always just contact Kathy directly to make sure that she's getting what she wants and additional information, leave that to you. Alicia? Um, thank you, Andy. My uh, question was similar to Bob's, but I just wanted to bring up that I may recall having a conversation when we were talking about the reserves about earmarking stabilization funds for the fire station specifically. And so I'm wondering if that is still something that we're considering. Yes. Yeah, so, so that would be money in the capital stabilization fund. That's what that that's what that fund is for. It can be used for anything, but we had designated it as building that fund up to be able to address one of our major capital projects. I think that what happened was, and thank you, Alicia, for bringing that up. Uh, when Sean Mangano made a presentation, I think in the spring, about the capital projects, one alternative that he brought forward was the idea of using the capital stabilization fund to um, take care of uh, building a fire station. And that was an alternative that he presented to the committee. I don't think that it went beyond that uh, report, but uh, it was uh, one of the things that he suggested. The, I, if anyone has a different recollection of what that was said, what was said at that point, or speak up, Bernie. Yeah, Andy. I, I think the uh, the general uh, overview of this is we're going to build up the capital stabilization fund so that we don't have to um, go back to taxpayers on overrides, and that would be for the that would be for the remaining major capital projects. We have the I think we have the, the libraries for a squared way. We certainly have an override for the schools to pay for the schools, although there'll be some more votes to come on that. I'm sure. Um, so we're really looking to see how we can leverage uh, construction of a DBW facility and a fire station uh, without going back for uh, for an override. Lynn? 
Yeah, I, Kathy opened up the discussion that I think isn't just um, get back to a counselor with some thoughts. It's really a discussion that either we as a finance committee should have and or the council should have. And that is the whole issue of if, if we were able to put together a multi-year road plan and show and figure out how we're going to commit money in a multi-year, would we get more attention from the existing or maybe new contractors? And that, that's a bigger discussion. It's not just an answer to one counselor. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. That is where I was going with it. Um, not on a, So it's not a one-time decision, but it's conceptually, what's our strategy? Right. No, and I didn't intend that uh, the response should come just to Kathy. I said if there was clarification about the question that... Uh, that clarification could go directly to the committee member who raised it. That's true of anything that we bring up today. Um, Matt? You're muted. Matt, you're, are you muted? We're not hearing you. How about now? Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, this is more of a fun question. Thank you, Holly, for this presentation and appreciate the questions already. Um, which, where will we see the new MS, the new state um, guarantee on the on the MSBA? Will that come into any of these accounts, or will that be a, a separate account? And then Amherst College as well. It sounds like Kathy wants to answer it. It looks like. The the debt for the um the school is excluded from from any of the calculations, so that's always above and beyond. Um, so it will reduce the amount of debt we have to take on, uh, and that tax the taxpayers had agreed to pay on pay for with the with the debt exclusion override. Um, the Jones Library the donation to the Jones Library went to the private side of the Jones Library. It didn't it did not adjust anything on the town's contribution. So that million dollars went to the fundraising efforts. Still will go into the Jones Library building, but it's, you know, as you right. know, the council allocated $15.8 million and that number isn't changed, hasn't changed. Yeah, no, I, I actually, so the the nine and change or the 10 from the state for the school, that doesn't come through our accounts at all? Yeah, it, it will, but it won't be reflected on free cash or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with those stabilization funds, the capital stabilization funds, free cash. It's all going to just be revenue sources into the total costs of that project. Mm -hmm. Can I add just one more piece to that, Andy? Sure. You know, we, we'll we get more certainty in the exact number. It's a good number that we have right now. It's potentially a little bit more, but it means that the state grant has gone up to about 50% of the cost. And at some point we have to go back, we did put out a chart, which we told taxpayers what the impact would be on them. And that's a piece of work. It's got nothing to do with the finance committee or our budgets, but that's something that's still to come because we're also going to be looking at this in an interest environment that that will be the interest environment, <laughs> interest rate meaning um, whenever we go out. But it's it's very good news in terms of the reduction and what will have to come out of a tax increase. Hey, Bernie. Uh, yeah, thanks to Paul for mentioning that the million dollars from Amherst College, which nice nice generosity on the college's part. Uh, went to the uh, the library trustees and not to the town because I've had a number of people say, "Oh, we, you know, we, May Amherst College just knocked down. The, well, they did knock down the, the the price of the library, but not on uh, the town side. Uh, that's one. And the other thing to mention is the million dollars. I think uh, triggered a humanities grant, so that that has a multiplier and it, it looks very good for the library's fundraising." Anything else at this point? Um, and uh, does any 
any comments, I guess, on, on the recommendations um, that um, we are ex expecting to have from the town manager or the request we're going to have from the town manager. Um, we can come back to that question again later. Um, I know that the next item is going to, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the African Heritage Reparations Assembly report. Um, we're still trying to um, get um, all of the information that we need and requested. And uh, Paul, has uh, anything been done or Holly about uh, um, staff work on any of the questions that raised or referrals to any of the sources for additional comment where that was on that list? So um, in the last week, we really haven't had time to work on that. Uh, we don't have, you know, but we were fortunate that um, um, Michelle has given us the question, the legal questions that she had asked, she hoped to get answers to, and we'll be working on those. But uh, we've been working on a lot of other stuff in, in the last week since you met last last Friday. So we just really haven't focused on that yet. Unless, I don't think you have, Holly, have you? Uh, I have not. I've been very <laughs> focused on DOR and free cash and getting your end reporting done. So yeah. that's been my week. <laughs> And, and just to mention, I mentioned this issue just to you early, Andy, I have to leave for a little bit and I'll be, but I will be back. So when you see my screen, I'll stay online, but I'll be, I won't be present. Okay. Duly noted. Um, unless, uh, do you have to leave right now? Just, uh, I don't know. I have like a minute or two. Yeah. So, um, let me just take uh, a pause uh, as to whether there's any questions that people want to ask regarding rental registration, which is the next item before we, uh, so that if uh, Paul's not here. Seeing no question, Paul, thank you. I just okay, wanted thanks. to see if there was any questions on that topic. I'll be uh, back. Okay, thank you. So um, back to uh, the reparations question. Um, is there any um, additional thought that any members of the committee have about information that you would like to need or further definition of the need that was uh, um, as we have developed those questions in the last uh, couple of meetings. I just uh, because I don't think that we're in a position today to actually have a really substantive discussion because we requested so much information and we really need answers before we can move forward. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lynn. With respect to needing to get answers. Um, at the same time, the town manager, uh, usually in preparation for our meeting on what will be uh, November 13th, will prepare financial orders consistent with uh, recommendations or, you know, if you will, past practice. So with regard to the reparations, um, uh, I'm assuming the financial order will be like we did last year, which is the hundred in this case, one hundred and five thousand dollars to be put into the fund. And I guess one of the questions I have and want to make sure that we all know the answer to uh, at the time when we have that discussion, which will be after the 13th. And that is that if we want that changed to reflect one of the other options how I assume that's asking the town manager to change it. The second thing is that if we don't change it, does it prevent future councils for, to, uh, from going back in and saying, you know, we're fine if, you know, whatever the committee is that's going to um, look at recommendations for the disbursement of these funds, uh, if they want to start spending X amount toward activities 
more before the fund is fully funded. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to know at a minimum, I, 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 I just want to be very clear at a minimum, I want to support that we do exactly what we did last year, which is to transfer all of the cannabis money, which is 1.5. But I want to know where are the flexibility given the options that are outlined in the AHRA report in terms of how and when we can do what they have requested. I, I, I Maybe yeah. I'm not being as clear. 1.5 though is not the correct One, number. 105. She 100. meant 100. It's 105. Yes. Plus some change. I wanted change. to make sure that nobody misunderstood that. Bernie, I mean, you guys. This... Yeah, two two things. One, um, I, I would agree with Lynn that the 105,000 should be um, part of the uh, part of the manager's financial orders. And the other thing, uh, putting on my non-legal hat, um, the actions of the current council can't bind the future actions of the new council once it's seated. That's why we have a charter. Uh, what we're bound to do is in charter and is in the uh, in, in the general laws. So, uh, if the uh, future council uh, chooses to exercise another option or another funding, they're they're free to do it so long as the charter allows them to take that action. But Bernie, uh, I am correct, and uh, it still takes two thirds of the council to make any decision to expend money from a stabilization fund. Right. Yeah, but the council, if two thirds of the new council chooses to do that, they can do it. It's the the actions of the current council can't bind the actions of the future council. Correct. Kathy. Uh, yeah, I think I'm building on what. Bernie just said, Lynn, I think those are completely different issues um, and that if we can affirm or confirm a commitment to doing the cannabis this year, um, it leaves open what we might do next year. But I think we also at the next finance committee meeting or other ones between now and the end of December should look be looking right at option A, B and C, or I call it one, two and three in terms of because the adding 105,000 based on what we heard last time, we'll get the the current reserve up to a little over $450,000. And so you could, you could, if there was a broader decision, be spending up to 100 with a, a flow in, partly a flow in and partly a flow out. And there are many combinations of that that would work. And I think um, that should be a completely separate discussion. I don't think we're prevented from making a, a range of ones. So I, I would like today to, whatever we do in a report back to the council, Andy say that the, the earlier decision on cannabis stands, we, we are encouraging the manager to come back with a financial order, but we've not, yet finish the discussion on option one, two, and three. That's that's not the end of that discussion. Um, that's my preference on the way we handle it today. Um, I think, I understand. Uh, Alicia? Um, thank you, Andy. My question, just in response to Kathy's comment, is do we have say in whether or not there's a partial flow in and partial flow out? Or does that that recommendation, is that not supposed to come from the successor committee in terms of determining how they think the funding would be used? Or is that in our purview during this current decision? I think that what Bernie's point was, uh, uh, they can come back to this, uh, if I misstated, is that uh, whatever we recommend as a policy can't bind a future council so that a future council has to make the decision so that if a request comes um, a year from now or two years from now from a successor committee, if one is created to transfer an amount of money for immediate expenditure, uh, that that's the decision that um, 
has to be made by the council at that time that it cannot we cannot bind them by establishing a policy. Bernie, did I state that correctly? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's an overall a general principle. And like I said, that's why you have a charter. Um, that's why we have a constitution. <laughs> uh, that's, the, those are the, those are the binding rules. The, the, uh, what, what the actions that one council takes don't bind the actions of a, a new future council. So in, in, in terms of deciding, making, we can make any recommendation you choose, um, but it will be ultimately the new council that, that takes that up. And Lisa, does that answer your question or I don't? Yeah, it, it is helpful, um, but I'm still thinking about it in reflection to like the choices that we have to make in front of us today, as opposed to like what the future councils are going to do. I'm like, I'm more concerned about what decision we're going to make right now, because I also think that that sets a precedent and a, and a clear, strong message. And so I think what we're going to do right now really also matters. Um, and so I'm definitely in favor of the 105 K, but I'm thinking about the long-term plan in terms of like sustainable funding to the, to the fund. Um, this is an interesting discussion in that it kind of may raise an additional question as to what it is that the charter and general law principles that Bernie was describing, if they affect the choices that we can make on the section three options that were presented by the AHRA. And uh, Lynn, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, reiterate that my goal was to make sure that we do at a minimum the 105,000 this year. And Kathy, I think, expressed that. It doesn't mean we have ended the conversation. It just means that as we look at financial orders that are coming to us for the meeting on the 13th, that we don't back away from that piece. Thank you. So um, I don't think that we thought we could finish the discussion today, but um, I want to just try and uh, get clarification because we are going to have to come back to this at the next meeting, just uh, on the 17th. Kathy? Um, yeah, so, so Lynn, I think it's good repeating ourselves. What I was trying to say is what you just said, Recommendation on the 105, it wasn't closing the door on us coming up with what do we think about one, two, or three, that we're going to come back to that and have a longer discussion on that. And I've, whatever we do, the council, next year's council, the council after, is the keeper of those funds. So Annie, um, what Ernie Bernie was saying, you know, and it's whether it's the current flow in or the reserves, the council has to vote the use of tax money. So it's always going to be, that's always going to be there. But we could set a framework for how we think if if the goal was up to $100,000 a year, how that might be achieved. And we could set that framework. But I'd like to have that discussion, a longer discussion around that, because I think it's totally feasible, depending on what the overall goals are. So it wasn't to say this is the end of the conversation, Alicia. It was just to get, we're going to get a financial order next time. Let's get this one moving. Um, yeah, Alicia. Um, okay, so thank you to both Kathy and Lynn. Um, I'm in agreement. And so I'm wondering if that's something that we can vote on today. So like, can we vote to commit the 105k to the stabilization fund um and we have to vote that we recommend that the town manager come back with some kind of wording like that is that correct yeah we can only we can only make it a recommendation to the town manager the decision has to come in the order that 
town manager will make a recommendation for transfers from free cash and it will be referred back to the committee. The committee will then make its recommendation. Uh, there has to be a public hearing prior to a council meeting and a vote of the council uh, so that there's a series of steps in place. Uh, at this point, we're really right at the beginning. So the most we could do today would be uh, a motion from the committee to recommend to the town manager that transfer. Uh, and whether that's necessary or not, it's up to the committee. Okay, so can I make that motion now? Would that be the time for that to happen? I suppose so. Um, okay, so I move that the finance committee recommend that the town manager um, draft a financial order to place the 105K into the reparation stabilization fund. Would that be decent wording for that? Yeah. Um, I wonder if it should be the amount of the cannabis revenue for the fiscal year, which is approximately $105,000, but it's actually tied to the, I think the way that Lynn was putting it and the way that we have done it in the past is it was tied to the amount of revenue. And in the last, in the year end report that we received at the last meeting from Holly, uh, there was an amount and it was uh, and it was 105 and change. And that's the amount that she had on her spreadsheet earlier. I I want to second the motion and just ask that we add the specifically specificity of estimated at present to be one hundred and five thousand five hundred and thirty seven dollars. Is that agreeable to you, Alicia? Yes, it is. Thank you, Lynn. OK, so we have a motion on the floor to make a, uh, I don't have the exact language, uh, Athena will provide that later, but it's a motion that the Finance Committee recommends the transfer of the cannabis tax revenue received for the past year, about 105,000, whatever the amount was that Lynn read is correct. Um, so we know what we're doing. Um, Matt? Yeah, I can I, I can put that together, but real quick, it's going to be a, a recommendation that the town council request the town manager. Um, the finance committee can't make that request of the town manager on its own. We can't request. We <laughs> can Can a committee make a recommendation that's non bind that it's not binding of? I mean, it's, it doesn't bind the council. The request doesn't. The request is to for the town manager to present the council with a financial order, and I think that request needs to come through the council, not from the finance committee. Will there be a so, council meeting prior no. to the no. um, recommendation from the town manager? No, no. We've we've done this before, Athena, where we've asked him to bring forth a proposal from the finance committee. I think we got into a little bit of a snarl when we did it that way last time because the finance committee can't take final action. And I think making a request of the town manager isn't something the finance committee can do. I think that needs to come from the council. Can I just ask a quick clar a clarifying question? So is Athena saying that our recommendations should be pointed towards the town council to ask the town manager? Yeah. And not to the problem we have is timing, Alicia, because right. of the the date sequence that council won't meet again until the point where the town manager is actually going to have made the recommendation. So we may just need to leave it that he's heard the discussion, but it can't be a motion, I think, is what Athena is uh raising the, the motion would be a recommendation to the council this body 
is uh, advisory to the town council. It doesn't act on its own. Paul's here. He can speak to this as well. That's just not true. Uh, Paul is Paul is not here. Paul is not in the meeting at the time. Um, I I I believe that we can make this motion. We can second it. We can vote on it, and fully realizing that the town manager is going to, first of all, listen, and second of all, will be presenting uh, presenting us with that, even though it never comes to a full vote of the council. So I would suggest we just move with it. Matt. So, well, this this is um, germane to the topic, but it's not. I, I feel like we have a, a question of procedure here that we're waiting for. But, but I, I would just say, I, my my impression was that we were we were tasked with making a recommendation on funding structure for reparations fund. I, th I thought that's what really what we were debating here. So I I was actually surprised to see us switch over to, you know, this year's financial order. Um, and I, I actually thought that was the thing that we were supposed to be studying and sort of, you know, coming to a determination on was the ongoing funding structure. And I was looking forward to learning more about sort of, you know, how much of that, the, the spend as you go model and the, the ABC models or one, two, three models. So, um, but I realize we have a question of procedure here and there's a, there's a motion on the table. So I will, I will refrain from going any further. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, question of whether we can recommend any of the models is um, going to be at the next meeting and the uh, which is where all of those questions were kind of to help us with the, those issues that one in particular and uh, I think the one thing that I added based upon uh, what Bernie had brought up and I've followed up one is whether um, the general rule that we can't bind future councils affects how we, um, what recommendation we make when we get to it next meeting. Um, so Alicia, your hand is still up. I want to make sure. Yes, sorry, I did have additional comments. Um... Yeah, just just because of what Matt just said, I also like I do agree that and I think it was already determined or established that we would have further conversations about this, that this wouldn't be the end of the conversation. And I personally would still like to see um, what I asked if Paul and Holly could bring back to us at the last finance committee meeting in terms of like the pros and cons or impacts to the budget of accelerating the full funding of the two million up front. Um, and so like, I would still be hoping to explore that option and to get those answers. But for right now, I think that this is a good first step. Um, and I would also like to move forward with Lynn's request and just wanted to point out that it still would eventually make its way to the full council before it could happen. You're talking about it happened it as in the motion the transfer of the hundred and five yeah thousand from free cash into the i mean that ultimately is a council decision we have uh we're going to only be recommending this is kind of a preliminary happy uh yeah i just are we meeting on the 17th next friday yes. so Not next friday next friday uh, holiday it's two weeks from today. Okay, two weeks. We're meeting on the 17th. So in the normal course of events, to the extent there's anything normal, we get financial orders referred to us. And in the last several years, it's been what to do about free cash. So um, sometimes where we've had a discussion and sometimes out of the blue, we get recommendations like setting up the stabilization fund, which was a great idea. So by November 17th, we will probably have some sort of order, correct, Lynn? Because yes. we could act on the 13th. So some of this, this nuance of, can we ask the town manager to do something before he, it comes from the council to ask him, usually it's come from him to finance and we recommend it. So I think we're talking about, it's always going to be 
it's on the same timeline as I guess what I was getting at. We're going to be seeing it on the 17th anyway. And I think, you know, when Holly presented to this to us, it was the assumption that all $105,537 was going over to the reparations fund. So if our motion is not completely kosher, and I'm not sure I can use that word, but completely all the dots and T's, um, I don't think it matters because we're going to be seeing it at the same timeline. So I'm suggesting we we take a vote on it and then later on we can determine that we've not got the wording quite right, but the message is clear. And then we can have the fuller discussion next time. So that's my suggestion on a way to end the circular circularity around this motion. But did you just go forward with the motion that's on the table? Yep. Okay. Um, Lynn, could you very quickly put up the uh, work plan and focus on the section that begins today around today's date? And I think it'll be very clear what we're doing, and then I'm going to call for a vote. Uh, but... Uh, It'll be clarification for everybody, including the public. If you have that available, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for it just real quick. Give me a moment. Don't worry, I got it. There you go. Okay. Uh, so go down a little bit on the page so that you have uh, later dates is available. Scroll down. Okay, stop. Um, so what you see on the screen, just so that we're clear about it, is that uh, the next council meeting um, listing is the 13th, which is the financial indicators meeting, which uh, I'm also going to see if we can get posted as finance committee meeting so that resident members can uh, fully participate. Uh, it doesn't list that now, but it should. Um, but in any event, uh, Referrals, free cash transfers, other supplemental budget requests is there at the bottom. And uh, so the, that is the item that we assume will be presented by the town manager. And then it will go um, back to the finance committee. And if you look on the 17th, the second bullet recommendations on supplemental budget requests, that's where we will actually make a recommendation to the council for action. And on the 20th, I believe, um, there's the public forum that is put there so that we can have a public forum prior that's required by the charter and then the vote would be at the council meeting after the forum so that is the process that's the sequence we're talking about so i hope that's helpful and if there's uh, no other discussion i'm going to call for a vote on the motion so that we can proceed Seeing no others, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with Anna. Aye. Lynn. Aye. Bob Higner. Uh, support. Uh, Matt. Support. Bernie. Support. Kathy. Uh, yes. Uh, how many yes and the um alicia yes okay so the vote is unanimous um uh, with support of all three um, uh, resident members of the committee and uh i think that we is there anything else that anybody wants 
wants to say right now by the HRA. Otherwise, we'll come back to it in the next, next meeting. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I want to clarify with the questions that we're providing to legal counsel or wherever Paul feels he needs to go to get the answer. Perhaps he has one. And that is that if if at some point between now and the end of this term, the finance committee recommends to the council and the council accepts some way in which money is added and allowed to be spent by the successor committee to AHRA, um, that that can be done and that actually would carry over to the next council. So, I mean, they can always undo it, but unless they vote to undo it, it seems to me that it should stand, but I wanna make sure it does. Okay, I'll put that back into the, uh, if uh, Paul uh, needs clarification, that uh, he should go back to the person who made the request for clarification, because I don't think we want to perfect language on it now. No. Kathy? Yeah, and I, um, I've just become aware of the request to legal counsel, um, and I'd like to make sure that we, the council committees to whatever we need, that it comes as a collection rather than a few at a time for different sources. So I don't know how that's proceeding, Lynn, but I'd like to have a package and it shouldn't just come from AHRA. I mean, cause there's some, there's some things I think we all think need to be clarified and I'm not sure which of them are legal issues. So, you know, Lynn, you, you added one I hadn't even thought of, but you know, Framing that question in a way that it can be answered one way or the other would be useful. Um, so, Andy, I know we don't have direct control over this. Um, Paul has control, and I'm seeing just Paul's picture right now, but it's something I'd like to convey to him. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it's just it's just more efficient. I mean, we we it's more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just so that you know. Uh, this is also referred to GOL, and GOL has has questions that they have posed also that are different subjects from germane to other parts of the AHRA recommendation. Bernie. Yeah, just very quickly, if if the council, this this committee makes a recommendation to the council, and this council sets up a program process. Um, whatever that rolls forward until the new council chooses to change it. Right. Thank you. So, that's so that's even, where I was going. Um yeah. So if, if there's a if there's a vote uh to you know have a successor committee make decisions and the uh council as a whole accepts that and passes that it it, it stands until somebody a pre a future council chooses to reverse it. And if that takes a supermajority vote, then that might take a supermajority vote if we're talking about spending money, certain monies. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, just a couple of observations, and then let's try and go on to the next agenda topic. Uh, the uh, original proposal to create this fund uh, as a stabilization fund, uh, Sean had recommended it to us and we acted upon it and uh, have been going with it. Um, but, it, you know, and he used the term act like an endowment. But uh, the questions that are also out there in my mind is, has it been earning interest so far on the, as the money has been in the fund? Because if it's acting like an endowment, that would be what it would do. And uh, if the purpose was to create a fund that has an endowment level, it's usually that you try and not spend the um, body of the fund, you spend the gain on the fund and how that um, is to proceed. And I think we may need clarification on how this can work and is working. 
Kathy? Um, I think that's a decision on the table, Andy. It doesn't have to be an endowment fund. But my understanding of when the town is holding two or $300,000 in a reserve fund, it's not completely an idle cash, Holly. You can, you know, it's, uh, if it's not to be pulled on, and so we can make sure that it's, uh, you can do short-term CD notes if we need, if we have to have access to it. But are you saying, I can't imagine we would hold that much money and not at least get short-term interest on it. So that doesn't, the two are not mutually exclusive is what I want to say. You can build up a fund, draw down some of it and still get interest on base. Um, so uh, I'm sorry it, are you guys there I keep freezing up over here um yes I mean the fund is certainly earning interest um it all of the town's funds and trust funds and stabilization funds um earn interest these are um invested again this is the treasurer's purview but these are invested um like our our larger trust funds like opeb and uh stabilization um and they have been doing pretty well this past year so there is certainly interest that is being earned on this fund and i can probably quickly tell you what it earned in the past fiscal year. It's uh, earned over $7,200 in interest in the past fiscal year. I, I was just making the point, they're not mutually exclusive. You can be right. spending some of your fund and still earning interest on it. Yeah. So it's it's a decision to create some kind of permanent base. I worked for a foundation in New York, and when we had to, we used our endowment. Um, we drew on it. We didn't just draw on its earnings. There were a few years because of what the stock market did. We we pulled it down. Um, so yeah, uh, though uh, when you take money out of the fund, then you're going to earn, then there's less money in the fund to draw interest to, and other gaining. So, Bernie. Yeah, there, there's a so-called safe withdrawal that um, folks who are more clever at accounting than I am uh, can, can calculate that tells you how much you should be able to withdraw for, from a fund and still leave enough to, to sustain it and, and continue to build it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, is we're doing rather well right now because interest rates are rather high. Under uh, typical circumstances, towns are constrained in where we can invest uh, or where, where we can deposit monies. So we, we can't put it in a fund that knocks it out of the park, to be, <laughs> to be blunt. Uh, you, you know, if you want to do that, you need to have a private entity managing the money. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're limited. Holly can, or the treasurer can tell you in more detail than I can where the money can go, but it just, again, it's dumb luck because, um, uh, interest rates have gone up. We're, we're making more money now. If this was, uh, uh, two years ago and we were hauling down 1%, we'd be overjoyed. So it, we have to have some serious yeah. discussions about, is this going to be an endowment or not? What's it going to fund and how it's going to fund it? Because if you're talking about a $2 million um, fund that's invested with Vanguard on a private basis, you're probably looking at $68,000 a year that you can safely withdraw, assuming a 3.4, 3.6, somewhere in a safe withdrawal. Um, that's, you know, if you want to run a youth program with $68,000 a year, you're not going to get much. Uh, if you want to do soft seconds or, or silent seconds to help people buy buy housing, um, you probably end up doing maybe one, maybe two um, mortgages. So, so you really have to focus on what it is you want 
and what the primary purpose is going to be, and not a catch-all, a hodgepodge of stuff. Um, and, and you know, we made a commitment around two million dollars, and we made a commitment around the funding source, which is the c cannabis money. Um, so, you know, th th that's sort of the framework. And early on, when we had these discussions, I said we really need to peg a funding source, and I, I, I made that recommendation because we have a tendency to drift. Um, you know, so we have an agreement about a target fund. We have an agreement about a funding source. And, and let's have that successor committee really hone what is intended for the funds. And then we can be in a much better position to say, can we continue with our target allocation? Can we continue with our target funding uh, me mechanism for funding it? Do we have to accelerate the funding? What are we really looking at? So right now we're guessing, uh, and I'm unwilling to say we're going to borrow or do anything to build up a $2 million fund until one, we know what the purposes are for certain or better, maybe not for certain, but better. And two, we have some basic legal questions that still haven't been resolved on this. Uh, you, you know, we still have to contend with the anti-aid amendment. So um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the urgency. I appreciate the willingness to go forward with this. But I, I really think we need to have some better definitions and we need to have that successor committee in place can really focus on how um, what the primary goals are here. Uh, you know, I'll step down off the soapbox now. Okay, thank you. Do we conclude and move on to, uh, to uh, rental registration? I think we can. So um, let's change to rental registration. I just want to... Um, make one introductory comment, and that is that uh, a member of the public who uh, spoke earlier in this uh, still meeting had made several recommendations that I had said at the last meeting uh, that I would uh, see if those numbers that she was recommending could be uh, plugged into the methodology, the, the spreadsheet that was being used to determine uh, the amount of money it would generate. And uh, then I ran into a problem when I started working on that because it was basing um, part of the calculation on the number of bedrooms in the property. And uh, I then checked with uh, Rob Mora, uh, as to whether that information is in fact available, because if you look at the spreadsheet itself in the underlying data, which is in one of the, it's a, it's a workbook to use the technical term of Excel, and the fourth spreadsheet is the underlying data about the number of units and the sizes of units that are in the uh, available to support this and it does not include bedrooms and uh, Rob confirmed that bedrooms is not an available number uh, at this point that there is no counting until we actually have completed the first round of inspections which is a five-year process we really wouldn't know how many bedrooms are in each property uh, I assume unless there's some change that can be made to the registration form that requires that the next annual registration that that information be provided. Uh, but in any event, that's uh, uh, a barrier to moving um, to, to considering that, but I could not make that calculation. Uh, so I wanted to... Um, see what kinds of additional information that people would like to know and how we can move forward with this. Rob, I see your hand up. Thanks, Andy. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, what I what I mentioned was that we don't have an accurate count of bedroom, the bedrooms in these properties. Uh, there are numbers that we've been trying to check, but you know, based on the assessor's records over the years. And we did start asking for it as part of the application process, but uh, we have too many examples in situations where the, the bedroom counts don't match up, you know, between the application 
the uh, assessor's records and, you know, maybe even a special permit uh, that we have on, on the property. So that's why I was suggesting to get that number accurately and that we can rely on it. We, we really need to, it's one of the reasons why we need to do the inspection. Thank you. Okay. So, um, going on to this, I think that, uh, there's some general questions. I know I've talked with at least one other member of the committee about this a little bit earlier today. It had some thoughts that came out of it, but Bob, why don't you? Yeah, I, I have a general question, and I'm, I'm I'm sorry that I'm raising it at this particular point, but as I recall, I wasn't available at the original finance committee meeting where this was first discussed. And the question I have is why are we focused on a rental uh, registration fee that's sort of property based and not based on the number of actual units within the property uh, and bedrooms would be better but if we don't have bedrooms we we certainly know that building x has 12 apartments in it or something or we should know that um and so the, the question is it seems to me that um a fairer approach to a rental registration fee would count the number of units um, or bedrooms if it's if it's available um, rather than just lump a single property with you know a property with one bedroom you know a one one apartment with a property with 100 apartments it, it just so i i just think it's, it's going to be skewed a little bit towards the um it's going to be a higher burden on the smaller uh, landlords, the smaller scale rent landlords, and a, a lesser burden on the landlords that have a lot of units. So I just don't understand the logic of focusing on properties versus uh, units. Let me see if uh, Mandy or Rob uh, I talk, can say anything about the CRC recommendation and, and how it responds to that. Rob or Mandy? Rob can go speak first. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're hoping that the inspection fee, you know, per unit is where it more fairly represents the work that's going to be happening associated with each property and not in the permit application fee itself, where the process is generally the same. Uh, you know, not unlike, say, a restaurant that has 10 seats versus a restaurant that has 250 seats, it's a restaurant permit fee. Uh, so we did in the latest proposal uh, show an increase of units up to a cap. Now, one of the things we struggle with is uh, of the 1,258 properties, 900 and something of them are one and two family dwellings. So trying to um, balance the overall revenue collection on that kind of a split between permit types makes the, the very small number of large unit properties paying $10,000, $20,000 a year in a permit fee that just didn't seem just, you know, justified for the work that's involved with, you know, essentially issuing a registration card uh, annually uh, and renewal year to year. So it was really looking at trying to um, have, the, have the fee represent the work that's involved and hope that the inspection fee, that's the new added step with this proposed program would be, um, you know, would be where we'll we'll see a, a I guess a fair share of fees paid by those larger complexes. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Did you have anything you want to add, or shall I go ahead and recognize Kathy? Um, Rob basically covered it. Um, the the work from the town side, since these permits are issued on a parcel basis, not a unit basis is nearly identical. It's not exactly the same when you've got one unit or two units or 50 units or 100 units, but it's almost the same. And therefore it was very hard to justify, as Rob said, um, charging some 
a, a per unit cost for a permit fee when the work to the town and, and making that so different when the work to the town because the permits are issued on a parcel basis is very similar. Daphne? I, yes, I think one of the things underlying Bob's question, and it's just we had a quick conversation a day or so ago, is that the rental registration fee was going to be carrying part of the cost for the inspections. And I think you're saying you're separating them, that the rental registration fee is only for rental registration and that the renewal cost of that should be quite low unless it's changed hands or morphed into used to be two units and now it's 20 because of something happened. Um, so my, right now, my sense is when we went up on the fees, we are covering part of the cost of inspections because you don't have any other source. So it's uh, that is going into a pot of money that can be drawn on either complaint-driven inspections or I think your inspector, inspectors, if you had more than one, if they think there's a reason to go into the house, they could say, there's a reason I need to go inside. Um, they may not do that very often, but I, I think I've heard they have, they're authorized. So. So is the registration fee, should we be thinking about it? It's the paperwork side or the computer paperwork side of setting this thing up. And Mandy, I had asked you how much more information are, and you kind of given me a grid, but how much more information are we asking for than we already asked for? Because that means everybody's got to redo their registration, but trying to simplify that. So every year, if it's nothing's change, I can say still still accurate. <laughs> I still have this many units, et cetera. So is it supposed, are you trying to bifurcate? So the registration fee is only covering the cost of registration, you know, and inspection fees are covering the cost of inspections is my first question just on a strategy. Then related to that, if, some of the places are kind of problem free. They're clean places and others are problematic. I'm not sure that I should think they should have the same inspection fee because it's it's not just a reinspection, but it's a longer inspection because you've discovered there's something wrong with the wiring. There's something wrong with the insulation. It's got mold. They're there longer. So can we calibrate it? For example, you've gone in there's a problem. And one thing might be the zoning law is not being adhered to. So there are 10 people living in a place where we're supposed to be four. And then I'll figure out what you're going to do about that. But if there's something that needs to be addressed, can the second inspection fee be higher? Because it's actually more people intensive. So it's what Bob was trying to get at the intensity of what you're doing. Um, and at some point, do you say, I'm sorry, this, you're not fixing it, you know, do you get a one, two and three strikes, you're out. So, but it seems like the burden is too equally distributed among places that may be completely problem free. So the little guys are getting more hurt than we might want to, but some of the little guys might be investor owned properties where there are multiple properties and they're all problematic. You know, they're not owner occupied. They are problematic. So that's what sort of the strategy, because I'm thinking this has to be self-financing. It shouldn't be pulling on taxpayers unless UMass can kick in a bunch of money to help us make this work fine. But I'd like it to be aligned with the work um, in some way. And Bob, that's, I think what you were saying is, you know, Troy, is the registration fee carrying something else other than the price of registration? And I think you're saying, Rob and Mandy, no, it's just getting you into our listings and then inspection will be separately priced and assessed. So yes, that, and as you know, I've been trying to lower the number of inspections over time to a bare minimum for the places that long-term, because I wanna focus on the problems rather than on everybody. Um, so trying to think of how those 
those properties bear more of the cost is the other way of framing that. But if I'm clear, hopefully that was clear because it was a few parts. Yeah. It was Rob. Yeah, I think I think the um, the permit fee has to cover some of the other expenses. Uh, okay. It's not a it's not a clean split of what it takes to issue the permit with our staff um, versus inspection. So I think there's there's definitely some carryover there from the fees that'll be collected for the permits themselves uh, in order to um, uh, produce this you know this program staff that's needed. Um, I think your method the, that you're suggesting is great, but not really able to work until we get through that first five round five year round of inspections and that's what i keep struggling with is i don't know the answer i don't know how many properties are you know good with few problems i know there are so they're out there there's a lot of them i know the number of properties that we've responded to and worked through issues is a really small number uh, of the five thousand units that are in the program uh and, you know, our inspector all these years has really been there to respond to complaints. And that, you know, that kept John busy uh, for all these years. And you're right. Occasionally where we hear something from the police department or um, a really concerned uh, report from a neighbor, we, you know, we inserted ourselves and, you know, went out there and and asked for an inspection and and they're able to do that. It's very rare that we had time to to look for those types of problems. Every property we go into, the small number of them that they are, every property has problems. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot about it, you know, through the surveys that the CRC did about the conditions. And our experience has been that, you know, whatever we think, you know, of this bad condition of these these certain dwelling units, whatever number of them they may be, it's actually a lot worse and that's what we want to confirm and that's what that that's what this program is going to allow us to do and hopefully you know have a good conversation a positive conversation in 5 years about you know what we found or and probably even one in 3 years from now what we're finding and and you know hopefully it is you know that there are a few problem properties um but just don't know Good. Thanks, Andy. Um, as we look at this, what are the measures that we're going to have to basically see if it's making a difference? And when and are there is there going to be a way for an, an annual, I don't I don't want to get too formal, but an annual look at how the program is going. And with the potential that even before five years, there might be some adjustments to the program because clearly you'll be learning from the first day you walk out. Once you set the program up, it's it's a continual learning opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for a way to um, have the public and, and the council, obviously, uh, know how it's going and whether or not we can make some adjustments midstream in the five years. Thank you. Mandy? Sure. So uh, the council can always ask for a report from the town manager at any point in time, a yearly one um, during the budget or anything like that. But the way this bylaw and regulations are written is the regulations once passed by the council will be the purview after that of the board of license commissioners and the board of license commissioners generally works fairly closely with inspection services and other departments for all of what they do. And so, um, you know, we can trust or we'll need to trust that the inspection services department will be able to work with the board of license commissioners to modify those regulations each year or every other year on a, on a basis as needed in response to what they have been doing or have found. And those regulations include frequency of inspection 
and the questions asked on the application. Those are some of the biggest parts of the regulations are those items that we thought might need revised more frequently than not um, based on current conditions being found. I, I also, Mandy Joe, thank you for the reminder that it uh, then goes to the Board of License Commissioners just per the charter, the Board of License Commissioners provides an annual report to the town council at the time of the state of the town address. So we have one coming up. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to put, sorry to say, put my hand up to ask a question after Bernie. Bernie? Yeah, I, I'm uh, uh, in thinking more and more about this. I, I'm understanding the challenge that um, Rob and his staff face in terms of understanding what's going on out there and the fact that uh, things don't remain static. Um, what property was in great shape when they first walked in may not be in great shape in four years, five years. Um, and also the, um, the, the rules around uh, public safety and rentals may change. Uh, that might require some, you know, continue to require some some additional effort, um, and um, and rules that can't be grandfathered in because they're they're you know they they're they're basic safety things. So I uh, I, I appreciate the challenge that, that um, you're facing, and I'm less inclined now than I was previously to say we need to change this. I think the the things that have been uh, the, the small amount of the modifications that have been made, the intent behind this um, is is really pretty much on target. And uh, um, I, I really think we should be going forward with the whole the whole proposal. It's going to just it will um, it will uh, uh, be a burden on some folks. Um, some maybe more than others, but. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's the price uh, we end up paying because we've got such a complicated and widespread rental situation here in town. So let me uh, tell you what's on my mind and then uh, let Mandy respond to both. Uh, I guess the, uh, we're being asked to do a couple things. One is to be confident about the cost estimate that has been put forward, number of inspectors, um, and the general cost estimate that has been made and presented. Uh, but we ought to be taking a little bit of a look at that to make sure that we're comfortable with the, with the number. The second thing then is uh, assuming the cost, and Kathy alluded to this in her comment, and that is, um, is there any um, plan to or commit or, or possibility that um, the general fund might have to be um, used as a source of a part of the funds and how do we deal with that because we regularly as a committee, that's one of the things that we do is to work with the council to try and make sure that the requests for general fund usage represent uh, the priorities of the council. Uh, and uh, the third piece is um, that the $100,000 from the university for uh, rental housing program to assist with administrative rental housing programs. Um, should that be used uh, for this program as sort of a base amount before you, that uh, pays for that portion of the program costs. Uh, so I, th those are the three things that have been kind of stirring me all along. And I worry that we might inadvertently get into a position where uh, we hadn't intended to rely on general funds, but we've passed a bylaw that essentially forces us to use general funds because the numbers can't work otherwise. And uh, so those are things that I'm sort of struggling with. 
as I look at the uh, program, which I think uh, is very well thought out and uh, uh, something that the town that we need, but uh, having vented that, I, I don't know if there are comments about it, but I wanted to just throw it out. So back to you, Mandy. Thank you. I just wanted to add one more thing to my response to Lynn's, and it actually kind of touches on what you just said, which is not just the regulations go to the Board of License Commissioners once we, if this bylaw and everything else is passed, so does the fee structure and the fees. And so they are much better equipped. They've recently undertaken a full review of all of their fees. And I think their intent is to do that on a regular basis. Um, and so they are also much more equipped than we are as a council, given where our council um, priorities tend to lie in terms of legislative action to regularly review that structure, even after a year or two to see um, if it's working, and not just the structure, but the amounts, if it's working, is it covering what we want it to cover, um, or what they want it to cover, um, and that can also be included in a report to the council um, on a yearly basis, but then they can look at that and potentially modify it more frequently than is likely the council would. It's not to say the council wouldn't, but um, <laughs> they might look and modify it more frequently than a council. Yeah, um, you know, Andy, you said we should take a closer look um, at the projected expenses. Rob, my understanding from a conversation I had with you at one point was we are in some areas below market in terms of hiring people. So in terms of your guess on what it would cost to staff this de department on the extra inspectors, um, we should have some kind of margin in it. And I pulled down, I know this is a nutty way to try to understand this, but Burlington, Vermont has a pretty active registration and inspection. They seem to carry a lot of the program cost in the registration fees rather than the inspection fees. So they're more, I, I'd have to look at how they structure it. They might be more in the way Bob Bob was that the larger buildings are paying more because it's pretty substantial. And it seems to cover the cost of operations, you know, when they've got a uh, two parts that here's where the revenues come from. So I, I think a better understanding of do we have the expenses, uh, are they good, good estimates going forward? Um, you know, I know you can't predict where salaries are going to go over the next couple of years. You can't predict where health benefits are going to go over the next couple of years. So these would be primarily in-house staff, although Boston has a roster of inspectors where they seem to have some retired certificated, certified people they draw on when they are a little short on their own staff time. So I, they probably do contract basis, might be cheaper, but that's the holding the line because Mandy, it's not as easy. This isn't like the board of license is over a fee that is running a town department in quite the same way. They're over a restaurant fee or something else. This is actually supposed to be covering the cost of a town service. Um, so that's where I get a little bit antsy. And then I don't know whether it's possible to write into all of this budget permitting, <laughs> you know, that gives us gives us a leeway that if if we can't operate this to its fullest extent, we bring it back and say we have to modify this. We we can't do as much as we thought we could do. Um, we, you know, we're going back too often to certain places that never get any better, and now we're in the process of condemning the property. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what you might run into that's time consuming, but it's uh, protecting us on the um, the cost revenue side. Um, trying to find more comfort than Mandy's. Don't worry that we can reset the fees. That's a little at the issue if you're running a department where our enterprise funds have to cover their costs, which is why they build up reserves. Um, so that that's where my concern is, these projections with uh, we have a hard time filling vacancies right now. 
Rob? Yes, um, you're right. There's there's very few certified inspectors out there, uh, even at retirement age. Uh, you know, the few that are interested in working have lots of opportunities as code consultants uh, and, and, you know, other uh, more interesting, higher paying opportunities than coming back to work as an inspector. So uh, we are definitely challenged by that. Uh, my projections, I think, are pretty good. Uh, I've, I am estimating at the highest possible salary we can pay in the in the union uh, pay scale uh, with with these numbers that you've been provided. Uh, it doesn't rely on the full hundred thousand uh, dollars of the strategic partnership money that will give us a little bit of flexibility uh, if say our legal costs are higher than expected, or um, if there was a need to bring in a, a firm or some other um, you know, entity for a one-time expense, uh, we, may, you know, we may put some of that money into uh, our, uh, our, our tracking and publicly displayed system of licenses and um, activity. So, it, you know, I think it's not, it's not down to the penny. In fact, if anything, I would have thought that someday the, we would be talking about the fees coming slightly down a little bit um, once we got to know exactly what's out there. Uh, so uh, I feel really good about the numbers. I guess interesting of what your last comment was about, I thought that's how I would approach, I thought this, how the program would work. I wouldn't ever expect to to have to go to Paul and say, you know what, we need another inspector to do this. I, I see it as that's the limit of the program when we need to adjust and work within it. Um, but I feel really confident that with the things that we've built in, uh, such as not inspecting every single unit. So there's over 5,000 units. We're looking at inspecting about 3,000 of those over the five years. So we're not going to be into every single property. And I think when we take that into account and try to focus on those 600 units and still maintain the complaint response, um, you know, uh, piece of it that we've uh, had, you know, all these years and not give that up, uh, I think I think we'll be okay with the uh, the projected numbers. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit about what uh, Mandy said about now uh, the role of the Board of License Commissioners and analogizing to other programs that they run that are fee based, and uh, so sort of were two pieces to the came as a result of thinking that through for a moment. One is, uh, will the council feel comfortable in, uh, once it's established an initial fee structure, having an unelected board perform that function, given what we've noted already is the concerns that are out there and the second of all, what is the experience with other inspections like restaurants? Uh, restaurants done on a flat basis per restaurant. Is there a size of the restaurant that's considered? Is there uh, uh, is it for inspection period? Uh, I mean, how how does that work? Mandy. Um, I can't answer the second question. Hopefully Rob can. But the first one is I just want to remind this committee that CRC went to the council about a year ago um, asking the council what it wanted to do and who wanted who the who the council preferred having ultimate authority over both the fees and the regulations. Um, and we presented three options, the council all the time the Board of License Commissioners all the time, or the Council initially and the Board of License Commissioners after that. And the Council came back to CRC mm -hmm. and chose the option that is in this bylaw. Thank you, Rob. So for, for restaurants, we have a couple of licenses that 
get issued. Um, the, the food license, the health license is a flat fee that is the same for every restaurant. Uh, the building and fire inspectors do a an, uh, annual inspection prior to the reissuance of the alcohol license every year in the restaurants. And that has, um, it, it's almost entirely one fee except for um, occupancies over 400. And we only have, uh, I think there's maybe two establishments now or two locations with those numbers. Uh, so the 76 or so uh, locations all pay the same fee, uh, except for those one or two exceptions. Thank you. Think about that a little bit later. Um, any other questions that people want to raise today? I think that the one thing that I just want to alert the committee to is, is that uh, we do have a deadline. This is one we we pushed a number of other things off into the uh, list of things that we would recommend for carryover to the next council. But this one is problematic because um, if it, the bylaw is going to be adopted and the program is going to be set up to start operation in the next um, permit year, which begins with the um, program with the with the fiscal year that the town applies, so July first, then we really need to move forward and have something in place. So this is one where we're not really in a position to uh, put it off on the delay till next council list. If it is going, if we do that, we're putting off the year more of not doing the doing inspections and not doing rental registration in the improved fashion that we've really been pushing towards. Uh, Lynn. Thanks, Andy. And in fact, this does have to go to GOL. And um, at this point, it would be highly desirable if it would come to the November 20th meeting for its first reading so that the second reading could take place on December 4th. Yeah. You're muted, Kathy. You're muted. I'm trying. My hand goes down after I click something. Um, in today's packet, do we have the latest fee proposed iteration? Because I'm not sure that's what I have. So if I look at that one in terms of the fees, there was a there was a revamping. Um, it just confirming because is what we need to do look at the fees, the registration fees, the inspection fees, as well if there's a section, because as you know, I have raised it more than once and Rob has answered extremely clearly, why do we need to even have the option of inspecting places that are federally inspected? So it's left as an option. So is this the latest um, iteration on it? Owner occupied. And the current fee is 250, is that correct? The registration fee. Andy, please. So anything dated October 19th, 2023 is the current iteration that the CRC voted to recommend the council adopt. And Mandy, is what is the current registration fee? Is it 250? It is a hundred dollars for owner occupied and 250 for all other parcels no increase regarding additional rental units so it's a flat okay, so 250 for non-owner occupied no matter how many units are on the parcel per parcel and 100 for owner occupied so what we're looking at that's a no change scenario so we're we're looking at as new costs are the inspections uh, no, the new would also be the additional $50 per rental unit above one unit for non-owner occupied parcels 
up to $700 is also a change. Okay, so that that's Bob Hagner's asking, you know, to have some marginal increase in registration for the bigger ones. And okay. that is included in this recommendation from CRC. Okay. Up to $700, a maximum ceiling. And so for the, just looking at this for smaller, with the up to six units, owner occupied, in the first year-ish, they would pay a hundred bucks and then there would be an inspection. They might not be inspected in year one, but they could be in, expect to be inspected at some point in, during a five-year period. Is that a correct statement? Yes, so, that is correct. And I will say this, this Excel document may not be totally um, correct here. The, the fee chart, the Word document that shows the fee has an inspection fee of $150. This chart shows that it's base per parcel. Um, I don't know whether the fee chart does. Uh, Rob has indicated it would, I, I'm not sure which one Rob has indicated it would be, whether it's per unit or per parcel. It would be per unit. Yeah. Yeah, so so Rob, you're, you do a, if I'm 100 unit place, you wouldn't do all 100, you do some sampling of it and you wouldn't try to get all, as I understand it, we're no longer trying to get to all 105 years either. It's a sample for the biggies um, to not hit every one of them. Correct. And then, and then reinspection re is where you were a problem, correct? So that was one of the things. If you're being reinspected, it's because not all was well on, on time one. So one of the variables here is would a reins could you up the number on a reinspection and go easier on the first inspection so i'm looking at the inner and i don't have the spreadsheet i know i could play with this myself but a reinspection presumably is for something pretty major because you've given them a conditional uh unless you fix this you you're a problem property So it's a question. I'm not asking you to fix it right now, but that looks to me like you would only reinspect if something wasn't up to code, as opposed to you didn't have window shades or <laughs> something. Andy, I'll respond to that. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, you know, really, what I what I'm hoping we'll be able to do is you know conduct our inspection and provide a follow-up inspection and not have to charge for that. Uh, you know, I think that is the way I want to approach the, you know, the, the inspection process and help the, you know, owner and landlord make those improvements. I think the reinspection is really for those that just, you know, aren't responding to that or following through with what was a reasonable expectation or time frame where we could charge. I think that's a very unpredictable number, uh, you know, so we put that in there. Uh, and I think if in at this point, trying to rely on that is where, is a way we can get into trouble for, you know, our earlier discussion about not being able to cover the cost of the program if we try relying on that. You know, I, I think the majority of the time, the the response is very good to what we're asking for. And that one inspection is enough. And, and there's no need to go any further than that. And that's what I would expect to happen. Okay. And and we talked about Mandy, I think you fixed the wording already. A complaint inspection that turns out there was nothing to complain about. Um, you know, doesn't get charged or, you know, so we we had a couple worries that disgruntled tenants because of landlord tenant disputes might call in complaints. And when you get in there, what they're complaining about isn't of concern, correct? Uh, there was some wording put in that you wouldn't, you wouldn't done. These are all public comments or written comments that we've received. Worried about being 
not being held harmless for uh, nuisance complaints. Okay. If I may, Andy? Yes. A, a couple of things. So so to get this chart, I just one thing on this chart, to get this chart showing more accurate fees, this was done really late at night very quickly to be able to hand it to you guys the day after, in time for the day after we voted this at CRC. Um, uh, C11 should read 150. No, no, column C, row 11. The additional fee unit above one unit should just read 150 just to make all the numbers more accurate than they are now um, with every unit having an inspection fee. That'll update everything else in this chart, um, including the next page of estimated fee revenue. So you can see what that does to that, just to a little bit more accurate. Um, so um, you'll see that with that numbers, there may not need any use of, um, or very little use of UMass's revenue. Um, if you page up on this second one, um, you'll see base revenue um, required town support would be approximately $15,000 instead of higher. Um, to answer Kathy's question, we actually removed that from the proposed it, residential rental bylaw registration permit inspection fees or fee schedule. It should probably have a new title. Um, at Rob's request and suggestion, we made all fees, all inspection fees, $150, just a flat $150, with Rob indicating that his department does their own, um, uses their own judgment on whether to charge it and would always charge it on the required inspection for the permit and then uses their judgment on whether to require, uh, to charge the inspection fee on complaint inspections and reinspections. And I think Rob could speak more to that. Which is why there's two columns in this, in on this tab of, um, in column B and C of, a base it's expected fee and a potential fee um, revenue um, on B and C lines, I don't know, 12, um, row 12 of potential revenue if fees are charged for every single inspection line, uh, column eight or row eight. Those total revenue numbers, B and C recommend, B is the floor and C is potentially the higher amount if you charged inspection fees for every single inspection. Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I really wanted to save those other types of fees for really the extreme situations, um, as you probably can imagine, it's really time consuming to try to collect later for, for a service like that. So we're invoicing and following up and going through the steps to make sure the payments are made, um, you know, isn't always easy and we, we tend not to build our programs that way. Uh, so I wouldn't want I wouldn't want that to be a big component of the system. Uh, it would be really time consuming for a staff person to be able to manage that. Uh, so uh, again, you know, it's a it's a fee that's in the schedule if we need it for those cases that just aren't uh, doing what they should be doing uh, in a reasonable time frame. Then it's it's an option for us to. Um, to, to impose that fee. And it likely is a case where there might be court action or other things going on and it kind of gets rolled into that whole process as well uh, on top of those issues. Okay, so. Um... Whoever's controlling the screen, we see all of the clips. What do you want to see? That's up to the committee. I just thought, I didn't know who was controlling it. They might want to know that anything they show is on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And so the, what was just shown, and Mandy had you change a cell. Can you just put, I'm not going to look at it in the packet now. I don't have this. 
I'd like to just make sure I see it. So Lynn, she made one change, I thought, in in the Excel sheet, or you made it as she talked. Yeah, I'm going for this, the sheet. Hold on. That's okay. It's just you don't need to do it this minute. You're multitasking in an admirable way. Right. Well, Lynn is looking for that. I have to jump in. I'm so sorry, y'all. I have a hard stop at three. I, I tried to push it off, but I, I got to go now. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, let the minutes reflect that I left the meeting at uh, five minutes after three. Matthew, yeah. this, this is what you wanted to see? Uh, yeah, and Mandy had you change one of the, um, right there. the, that one right there. So that was a change from whatever was in the package. And it looked like you're working off the, exp I'm fine with working off an Excel spreadsheet. So if you want to just save it as Excel, fine. Um, well, um, I don't want to show my computer screen, God forbid, it would scare most of you. I know. Um, I, no, I provided this sheet to Andy to put in the packet so that everyone would have the Excel version, not just a PDF version. It, it The Excel version is what is in the packet. Okay. So are I, we... I, I think Go you ahead. have to add, the, if, it's, if you made a change, you should add this to the packet since you discussed it today. Thank you. I will do so. I'm going to take it down and add it to the packet as amended. And you can just put today's date on it and then I'll know we're already in November. So we really need to move forward at the next and conclude this at the next meeting if we're going to meet the timeline. Even then, it's uh, I'm not sure we're meeting the timeline, are we, Lynn? No, we aren't. Um, I, I think we actually um, should consider the motions today. Paul, well, I'm not sure that it went to the packet and because I don't normally place things in packets. Well, you can save it because uh, it's, you know, yeah, take just email it later. Yeah. Okay. I think so, it did. Just so you save the document is what you, I think is most important. So yeah. can I just ask the motion would be we're staring at a fee schedule and we're being asked, what do you think? And is the motion to accept this key fee schedule as proposed. Is that where we are on motions world? Lynn, when you said motions. And then my second related question is the one part of wording in the current bylaw, wherever it is, is reserving the right to inspect properties that are being federally inspected. And I've seen in several cities, those are exempted. So, I would make a motion to remove that wording wherever it is. And and I we've heard why that Rob would like it in and that Mandy has it in because Rob would like it in, you know, CRC considered it. So I'm just asking what what we're making a motion on. Is it mainly the fee schedule? I believe it's the fee schedule because CR uh, GOL then actually rules clear, consistent, and actionable. And a CRC has already made recommendations about rescind and replace. So if I, if I can jump in, yeah, I think the action by the finance committee is just on this, is on the fee schedule. Okay. I think the council still has to vote all these things. You, yes, other changes did. can still be made at the council level. Right. So, Kathy, you, you were making a motion about amending that issue yeah, it's it's that one piece because I think that potentially drives up the cost. Everything I'm focused on is driving down the cost of operating the yeah. program without hurting hurting the goals of the program. And I Andy see Joe, that. Can you quickly find that where that would be? And well, it's in the regulations. Um, but I would call, I I don't know. I would have the finance committee look at what its referral motion was for what it's supposed to be reporting back to the council. Um, that I need to, a minute to look for, sorry. I did, because I had to argue for it, say 
It is the fee schedule and anything else in the more general that has a an effect on the operations, the cost of the operation, the program. So that's why I flagged this one, Mandy, rather than looking at any other language, because I think it potentially has an impact on the cost of running the program. So it was, and other financial matters is I think the way we worded it, Lynn. Because <laughs> I know there was a suggestion that we not look at the wording, but we just look at the fees. Um, if anybody has any idea of when this was referred, I'm open to suggestions. I can probably find it. And Andy, I have to step off as, as well yeah. now. Um, okay. I'm pretty sure that it is the fee schedule. Um, I think we I think we should entertain the motion and assume that if we have to, we can correct the motion at our meeting on the 17th. Um, but meantime, I, what I'm really trying to do is get this over to, to GOL. Does GOL need to review the fee schedule, just the regulation, uh, proposed regulations and bylaw? Just the proposed regulations and bylaw. Athena. Oh, I have the you're... referral language. Okay. Go I ahead. can read I can read the referral language. Um to refer the finance committee the documents titled rental registration fee schedules, da da, da da and fee schedule samples for a recommendation on the fees to charge under general bylaw three point five zero and proposed re revisions to regulations to general bylaw three point five zero property on cost implications. So is the fees get the fee schedule, the fee schedule samples okay. and regulations um, regarding cost implications. Um. Is there anything that prevents GOL from looking at this? And by the time we come back next time, we have the motions from finance worked out. Athena? Mandy has a hand up. Okay. Mandy. If I'm not mistaken, GOL already reviewed this um, prior to CRC, after CRC voted this in August, um, GOL already reviewed and made a declaration at that time regarding the bylaw and the regulations. I'm not sure it was resent back to that at that time, I can look, I, I'm working on finding the council meetings to see if there was a GOL report on that. Um, but we would have sent this off to them per the original referral from 2022, that when we made a recommendation, it go to GOL. Right. Um, I, has it changed substantially though, since GOL looked at it? No. You can see exactly the changes that have been made since then in the tracked version that's in the packet. Right. Then I'm going to suggest, Andy, rather than, you know. But I'm trying to confirm that GOL right. had a report. I just have to find the right council meeting. And if we assumed the $100,000 would be automatically go into the it, from UMass would automatically go into supporting this program could we make modest adjustments to the fees and where would we make those adjustments because I was I would if I did it I would want to make sure that we're looking at the smallest small landlords who uh, we've had the greatest amount of concern about our discussion being the beneficiary of 
whatever we could do. And I haven't gone back and looked at the calculations for that. Lynn? My concern is that we're working on such a small margin that that's the kind of thing I would love to see the Board of License Commissioners come back to us or, or do something about in, you know, within a year or whatever. Uh, this is all about trying the program out, seeing how it really works and making adjustments as we go. I think the, uh, one of the things that we're, we need to do in addition is if we really mean that we don't want to see the um, number that's uh, not covered by fees exceed $100,000, because then it would have to come out of the general fund. Do we say so? If we think it should come out of the general fund, we at least need to have our eyes open and be know what we're doing. Andy? I just want to follow up on, on my last one about that. So at the same meeting that this motion to finance was made, um, a motion to refer the proposed revisions to GOL was made. Um, the permit, um, the proposed bylaw regulations and regulations was referred to GOL at that meeting in August. Um, going back since I sit on GOL, GOL has not yet taken it up, but there's nothing preventing them from doing so. So hopefully it will be on the next GOL agenda. Thank you. Bernie? Um, I'm just, I think I'm going to reiterate what um, Lynn said, um, but I'll do it a little bluntly. None of this is carved in stone. Uh, we do need to get moving on this. Um, if this goes forward and we look at the first year as a test, uh, uh, the council can ask for uh, feedback from the licensing people, licensing board. Um, it can be monitored. If it proves to be excessive and burdensome, it can be changed. Um, I, I think the um, Overall, there's a feeling that uh, that you know that that rentals do really need to be um, better supervised and regulated, and and unfortunately, um, that scoops up everybody. But I think, um, like as I said earlier, I think we should move forward with this and um, and, and test it. So, is someone making a motion? I just have one more comment, Andy, on your question. Um, the the issue of the small. Oops, I gotta take the sun out of my eyes. Wait a minute. This this we're we're protecting the small owner occupied with up to six six units, but if we have a property owner that lives in their house and is running two other rental units. Um, we used to have this inside Amherst, and we don't have that anymore because we didn't think it might be legal. Their fee is two fifty, and they're going to have an inspection fee, which has a variable on the number of units. So it's a fairly substantial increase um, on the per unit. So that's where, if we had one more row. Um, for the smaller and then figure of the smaller, we've got a real mixed mode of, of groups out there. And the inspection fee is gonna, if they have to be inspected and then re-inspected is gonna pick up some of that. But I'm just looking at what it does because there's a variable cost on the number of units and it starts out at 250. So if I had, I'm operating two additional rental properties or three units. It's um, a jump up and an inspection fee, which is potentially 
an inspection fee for more than one unit. So I'm, I'm looking at the small one. Uh, and it's where Bob was going on um, the margin. Could we have another line between five and six that's what I call the small guys that aren't owner occupied? And what Lynn's comment was is you change any of these variables and everything changes. <laughs> you know, you lose the revenues that you were collecting on line seven, um, some of them. And so, so it it's a question, and I don't have time. You know, I'm looking at there. There's a fair number of properties. There's quite a few in the only one unit, and then there's two and three units. We've got uh, another three hundred. So I I would keep that next tier smaller. So. Mandy, you you all probably looked at hundreds of variations on this, but this idea is could we keep it at the lower end and have it either, you know, the initial fee is 150 instead of 250 and then a 50. You know, I'm just looking at something to ease, ease it on the smaller without changing. So I do, you know, every... Number number seven would still be all above three if we went to two to three. It's a question of the group. And just for those who aren't staring at the schedule, there are if there is eight hundred and forty seven that are one unit, two hundred and eight that are two and 78 that are three. And of those, some of that gets reduced because of the 847, 110 are owner occupied. We've already helped them. So so Andy, I am responding to what you asked with a, there's a line yeah. where, where we could do a variation that eases the first few years of this for what I would call smaller landlords. <laughs> and they'll only get, they'll get hit hard if they're in a property that's a wreck. Um, but they'll only have that inspection fee once if all, all is well. Which would mean I get the calculations done today because uh... You know, Lynn, I didn't mean in one is owner occupied because we've we've protected all the owner and five all the owner occupied or it's just the so just that second phrase you've got and one is owner occupied yeah that goes out. Do do hear do people hear what where I'm going or can we leave this like there might be a variation there that we'd like to see that might work where I'm trying to still bring in the same amount of revenue. Uh, that's it. Yeah, Mandy. So CRC looked at um I I I'm not the way this Lynn has worded this, if this is what Kathy was going for, someone who owns only a certain number of units. Um, CRC looked at that one. And so I I guess the question is, is that three different parcels with three units on it or one parcel, so up to three dwelling units, so up to a triplex, three rental units on one parcel and, and all. Number one, it, it would need to be clear. But number two, when we asked Rob about this, um, Rob favored simplicity because of administration costs. Um, so you'll notice that between when you sent the questions back to CRC, CRC came back with a more simplistic fee schedule. Um, if you would change the base fee for all other non-owner occupied parcels to 150, instead of 250 for example the max fee charged would on this chart default to 600 um i'd have to change a bunch of different num different 
cells to, to continue to default it up to seven and then do a bunch of different calculations too. Um, and it would be a harder calculation to make. But um, so if it defaults to 600 instead of 700 because of the, um, so still up to 10 units is, is sort of where the max fee goes. Um, the estimated fee revenue decreases total such that the required town support would be above $100,000. Um, just for an example. Um, so, you know, you might be able to split stuff off. The other thing Rob had indicated was it's generally the more smaller units that have more problems and cause more time, staff time, not necessarily the 10 plus unit buildings um, that, that do so. So Mandy, what you're saying is instead of adding a row, you could play, do something in column B and column C. Um, but you'd have to be careful of how you did it to still come up. You've capped it at a certain amount. You might have to go higher than the cap, which is where Bob Hagner was talking, you know, collecting more money from the big ones. Yes. So if you want to play with the numbers, I would delete the new row six. Um, because it it's just tough <laughs> um, in, in order for ease, ease of playing with numbers. Um, and you can change the numbers in row, the now row six in B and C. Anything in yellow you can change and it will populate through all of the tabs. Um, except those tabs for the maximum fee charged are based on a maximum fee of you go up to no more than 10 units. So the numbers in the other cells are based on a, a maximum of 10 units. So anything that has more than 10 units is thrown into this calculation there. So if you wanted a maximum fee higher based on a number, because because the 700 came from the number of units. 700 is any, uh, uh, you increase the application fee until you get to 10 units. Once you've got 10 units, any parcel size with 10 or more dwelling units is capped out at 700. So if you want to change that cap to a different number of dwelling units, then we have to change some of the other cells. But right now, the cell changes are based on a cap at 10 or more units will pay the same fee for the application. Yeah, that is clear. So the other way of saying that is you've got, you're collecting 354,000. So you'd have to lift the cap on additional units if you go down on one of the others, if you still want to end up with $354,000 collected, or you've got a shortfall, right? So I see Bernie has his hand up. I was just looking for a, a way of, um, I would rather go up on the infection infection inspection fee for a problem place than a registration fee for everyone. But that's just a preference for trying to target. Um, so I, I'll stop talking. Bernie? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm at a loss as to why we just had this very lengthy discussion to try and protect a small number of individuals who apparently are fortunate enough to own three pieces of property in Amherst, one of which they live in and also rent. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, they must have some substantial um, resource, financial resources, if they own three properties. Um, and I, I think this is getting, on, this is, we're now getting unnecessarily complicated. Um, uh, I understand that some people will feel disadvantaged, probably most everybody will feel disadvantaged by this. I also think that having, uh, as with the town of, as with Burlington, Vermont, having some of the operating costs covered by the permit fees uh, is a more sustainable way to run the program. You can count on that. The number of inspections is a variable. Uh, and again, my, my feeling is, is that this has been, this is done, stick a fork in it, move forward with it, try it, monitor it, watch it. Um, and 
and see how the thing works. I need to um, note that Alicia Walker had to leave as well. And I'm going to go back to my next suggestion. Since we've already determined that GOL can take this up without us doing anything today, that they we we will I will urge them to do that at their next meeting. The second thing is that in preparation for our meeting, which is a week from today, uh, am I correct it's on not that? A week from today. No, it's not. It's on the 17th. Uh, in preparation for that, that we look at what our motions need to be. And if there's going to be any other amendments to this, that it be worked on there, we not try to do spreadsheet work as a committee. I think that's right. And that um, that allows all of this to come to the council on the 20th of November for a first read and hopefully finish it on December 4th. Great. So that means get any proposed motions to Andy. I mean, if there's a change so that we have a motion, a draft set of motions to act on, on the 17th. Is that what you just said, Lynn? That is correct. The only thing I would do is add, get them to Andy and Athena. Okay. I'll point out that the only other alternative is to schedule a special additional meeting, but we're trying to avoid that. I I don't know how we're going to avoid it since we didn't even get to the issue of guidelines. Yeah, so the guidelines we normally don't handle until after we have the financial indicators meeting. Right. We put it in there in case there was any pieces that we could put away earlier uh, policy issues uh, like we want to propose to avoid over overrides, for example, those kinds of things. But I don't think they take that long, so I don't think it's necessary. Because I was going to uh, propose that we skip the next two agenda items, uh, six and seven, after we complete this discussion. So where we are then is that people would are going to work on it at home alone. Um, they're going to, if they're in, try and work towards motions um, so that anything that would, a motion would first be motions to change the proposed um, schedule, the schedule. And then the second uh, would be just the overall motion, which is pretty obvious. Once we've done that is to uh, recommend the fee schedule uh, as it comes from that meeting. So that will happen on the 17th. And uh, we anticipate then concluding this uh, recommendation on the 17th. So, uh, That sounds like an acceptable, and I don't think that we need to uh, necessarily have further discussion of the real property disposition policy today. It was put on there in case we wanted to uh, draft budget guidelines we've already talked about. So I'd like to come back to the meeting plan uh, when we're done here. Bob? Yeah, Andy, I just, uh, for the real property disposition policy, I just want to throw out that I think the policy should uh, state that we have a, you know, wherever feasible, uh, if we're disposing of a property or demolishing it, we we attempt to recycle or salvage what can be done, salvage from the, the property. Um, we could actually probably get someone to come in and you know take in you know take materials and recycle them and uh we could charge a fee for that um and rather than 
paying somebody to demolish a property, we could actually pay them to take stuff away. Uh, so anyway, just put that out there. Uh, I, I don't want to have a discussion of it right now, but I just thought it was a, a thought that, that occurred to me that we should think about over time as we as we you know think about this policy. Thanks. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. When I was uh, meeting with constituents, I ran into a constituent who uh, had exactly the same suggestion, uh, but based upon knowledge of the quality of some of the materials that are in the schools that are being demolished to make sure that we're taking advantage of it and we're not unduly enriching somebody who's doing the demolition and not yep. fairly and not fairly compensating us for what's being taken out. Kathy? Um I since we may or may not get to that next week, next week, two weeks from now, I have some specific comments on the draft we got. And it sounds like what Bob just had is a comment. Could I make the suggestion that if we send them to you and I would just send them to you in bullet format. Then if anyone else has any comments, I very much like the process that East Hampton looked at use, for example, and I've got to figure out where it might fit in a policy. Um, so if, if we could start with both the draft and having people thought about it the way Bob just did with a list of things that are either missing or need discussion, it, I think it would be productive. Um, just to remember that we had suggested that this be on the carryover policy for the next council and uh, that what we're really just looking for right now is when we develop the carryover list, what questions are that we recommend that the next committee look at um, as it does, as it takes up the policy again so that we don't lose our thinking about it. It isn't, our time invested isn't wasted, but it's not something we're gonna discuss or consider within this committee term. So, I, think that, I think that's perfectly fine. So what I'll say, I'll rephrase mine, that if we have things that we want to accompany the carryover that were thoughts we had or questions or suggestions that they go in a document that we don't, lose it because we've been staring and thinking about this for a couple months, or we started thinking about it a year ago. Um, I just think it would be useful for the next council as well that we capture that. And we don't have to have a long discussion, just you can compile it so people can not know where these ideas came from or questions came from. Yeah, Athena, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, there was uh, one member, actually, Lynn had sent some edits to the policy that are shown in the version that's posted online, the draft that's posted as red line changes. So I just want to make a note of that. If there are other specific red line changes, then I can compile those into the carryover draft. Um, but then other questions and issues, I think, are better sent to Andy for the carryover. Okay, thank you. So send them to me and I'll work with you. If you want to do them as uh, amendments to the uh, to the draft itself or um, comment boxes on the draft, um, anything that we can do to not lose our work in reviewing it and get it to the next committee. So, We have a plan. We will uh, reach uh, SGOL to go ahead and do its work. Now we're in the here, and uh, I'll work with uh, Lynn and Athena to update our meeting plan. The only thing that I wanted to alert you to is this question that was put forward is knowing the amount of meetings that and the amount of work that we have to do, should we be considering a possible additional meeting? Uh, I think that that, 
is in under 17th do we schedule a second finance committee meeting this week and uh it has to do with the amount that we're going to have because um this is going to be post financial indicators meeting so that we're beginning the budget guidelines discussion and we put a lot into the 17th uh so uh Athena had suggested that we uh, raise that question as to whether we should be thinking about a second meeting as opposed to overloading the 17th. And once we've gotten that done, I think we're done for the done for the day, unless there's other unanticipated business. So sir. Anyone who has strong feelings on the question of a longer meeting on the 17th, which could be a very long, much longer meeting or two meetings. And uh, if we're, if you want us to think about two meetings, then um, Athena and I have to get a memo out to try and find if there's a possible date. Yeah, Angela. Angela has to we're putting it on her. Okay. You know, if just Andy looking at this and then looking at a calendar, there are no Fridays. So you're saying we'd have to find another day of the week somewhere. That's right. That's um, right. And I know that that's problematic for Felicia. We have to recognize that. Well, long meetings on Friday are also problematic. Um, Which well, is why we're running good. <laughs> it's not every long meeting. There was just a three hour meeting this morning. So some, some days are harder than others. Um, so Athena, I don't, yeah. Yes. I was going to see this and then come back to you, Kathy. Athena? Um, I don't think we have enough. I don't think we have enough members to make a decision about a meeting. We're missing three people, so I can I can send a poll. I didn't say Angela. I think that was on somebody else's mic. Um, I can send oh. a poll out to the committee, and if we can find a meeting, meeting date and time that works um, after the thirteenth, then we can do that. And if not, then then I guess we can. Kathy. I Th that's fine. There are we've got a quorum here, but it's it's a question of whether we're willing to meet another date, and so then um, Athena is going to have to poll us to find if it's possible to meet another time. Um, so, I we've got a tight timeline on guidelines between draft and final. So, it may be for guidelines we need to do that. I I have no idea you know, whether this is going to be a smooth process or not this year. No idea. So, yeah, I don't either. Um, I, strongly, I strongly urge us to look for another meeting time as well. I think just to hold the date and we'll see if, if Friday is important for one particular member, make sure the issue she cares about is on a Friday and then, you know, work, be strategic about what the agendas are, I guess would be the way of thinking about it. If it can't be on a Friday. Since there are no Fridays left. Okay. If that's a general agreement, I think that uh, what we'll do is uh, send out a, poll for alternative dates and uh, see if we can get a uh, get an um, acceptable size uh, of the committee uh, present available for the, for any one of the dates that's available and uh, the secondly we'll ask um, just everybody the same question not just if you can't attend a meeting, what are the most important issues for you of the list on that are for that week? So is that agreeable? And if it is, then that's what we will do. 
and I have no other business that's uh, unanticipated. Um, does anyone else have any requests for our unanticipated business? Going once, going twice, I guess we're adjourned. Thank you. Everybody.